Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode of the Toro Cigar Lounge Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Glover, a.k.a. 757 Cigar Mike. Stay tuned today, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing another veteran spotlight, and today we got Ranger Bill in the house. <laughs> we'll be right back. In a world desperate to separate us by our differences, there's still a place where you can go where all are welcome. The Cigar Lounge. Welcome to the Toro Cigar Lounge Podcast. Okay, we are back. Welcome again to the Toro Cigar Lounge Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Glover, a.k.a. 757 Cigar Mike. Today, we are doing another amazing veteran spotlight. So, um, before we get into it, though, let's go around with some quick introductions. And uh, we'll start to my far left, your right, with Jake. Hey, I'm Jake McCluskey. You can find me on Instagram at Bearded Cigar Lover. And our veteran guest is? William Jones. And you can find me on Instagram, but it's not worth it. <laughs> That's not my handle, though. There you go. It's not worth it. At not worth it. Probably taken anyway. That would uh, actually I'm be good Ken. One. You can follow me at Ken Blue Smoke if you want to. And I today I am smoking a Warfighter uh, Field Maduro, um, but they are not the, spo the 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 sponsor of our podcast. Family by Loyalty is the sponsor of the podcast, and you can see some of their offerings down there. They have fantastic cigars. The best way to experience Family by Loyalty is to get one of their five packs. We sell them. They sell them. Get them from us. And uh, that's our sponsor. They actually are. They, they're not selling cigars. They're not they? selling cigars. No, it's, they, if you want them online, you got to come to us. They're, Let me correct myself. Get them from us. Just get them from <laughs> us. You stand so, corrected. So I'm smoking the Warfighter Oscuro Maduro. Uh, it's a little bit stronger cigar, but it's right in my alley, my, right in my, my wheelhouse. Jake, what are you smoking? The uh, I'm smoking the Field Habano. My, actually, my favorite cigar from Warfighter Cigars. So. And we gave Bill our Warfighter Connecticut. Field Connecticut. Field Connecticut. It's very yeah. smooth. So the difference, uh, this is a Garrison Oscuro Maduro. So uh, the Warfighter does two different kind of strengths and blends. They have a Field and then they have the garrison. So the thought process is if you're smoking a field cigar, you're out in the field, you're just you're just taking a break, you're out on patrol maybe, and you get a few minutes of downtime, you can have a field cigar, which is not quite so strong. Um, it doesn't relax you, blah, 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 as much. And you can still be functional. functional. And, it, and, and, and they do the field Maduros at a, a cheaper price point in case... You know, something does happen. You got to throw the cigar out. You're not wasting right. big money. Exactly. On the other hand, the Garrison, when you're back at, at home camp, a little bit stronger cigar, you, you're you probably going to be able to enjoy it a little bit better, but it's definitely going to have a little bit more of a relaxing effect on you. But you can because you're back at Garrison. All right. Well, again, welcome, Bill. Thanks for joining us today. Sure. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, I've known you now for, well, since I started dating my wife back at Crossroads is where we met. Yeah, like so 15 years, 15 years now, yeah. Six, 16 years, Wow, 16 years, it's been a day. It's been a day. It's been a day. So we're, we're super excited to have you on. So did he know you when you still had hair? No. The, oh, okay. The hair left a lot longer before that. The hair left had a, a had long had time ago. He knew me before I had a beard. That's for sure. Yeah, it's started growing out of a different spot yeah yeah <laughs> my hair grows down not up <laughs> grass does not grow on a busy street right god only made a few perfect heads everything else he covers with hair that's that's the way i describe it okay so hey let's start with your story you are you're a retired army i am retired army both um uniform and as a civilian so i had just that 40 years in the army uh 23 24 in uniform and then 16 in uh as a civilian working mainly at fort eustis but also fort monroe wow. very nice very nice so when did you enter the army and and was it enlisted well, enlisted well my story actually begins i graduated i can tell my age i guess i definitely look it but i graduated from high school right here in virginia beach close by from princess Anne in 1976 and then i enlisted actually my first service was in the air force reserves i i, I don't 
I can't remember the rationale for signing up. Other than <laughs> you wanted to play a ton of ultimate frisbee, probably. If you're yeah, I, I don't know because my dad was retired Navy. He was a pilot in World War II as a, uh, in the Navy, and then served a career in the Navy and ended up being a civil servant in the Navy. But I ended up I, I think mainly because VCU um, had a when I'm drifting off of the Air Force, but VCU had a Army ROTC and they paid half my scholarship. Mm. But before that, I felt the compelled to serve, so I signed up, and I didn't want to be a full commitment, so I signed up for the reserves, went through Air Force basic training down in Lackland, and then served for about a year and a half in reserve status, working on C-5s up in Dover, at Dover Air Force Base. Okay. And it was uh, a good experience. I wouldn't say I was the best airman, for sure. <laughs> I, got, so, I got yelled at a few times. So, so you went in, you went through... Air Force Basic, and then along the way, you decided to enlist when, in the Army. When I Yeah, when I started going to college at VCU. So did you get to do basic training again? Well, they have a thing, excuse me, they have a thing that's called advanced camp, and I think it's called something else now. So it was quasi-basic training, but for college students down at Fort Bragg now, Fort Liberty. Um but yes, I, so I guess I did go through two basic trainings. Wow! So you enjoyed the drill instructor so much. You enjoyed the yeah. food so much. <laughs> you had to come he back did it twice. You had to come well, back for a more. Quick, so I knew I probably made a bad decision. The first year we did drill, as you know, in the reserves, you do, you know, one week in a month, and then, and then two weekends, two weeks, in the typically in the summer on active duty. In the first year in the Air Force Reserves, they said, "Well, do you want to go to England or Spain?" And I went to Spain and to an air base they had at the time called Rota, where there was a F-4 squadron there. Yeah. I stayed in the officer's barracks, billets as an E-2. I uh, worked about four hours a day on transit aircraft that came through. And then the rest of the time I was in Madrid drinking as an 18-year-old and watching bullfights and having a great time. Yeah, wow, Spain sounds there like go. a sweet gig. So, so then I had to transition when I went into the Army, uh, into Army ROTC. I had to tra transition out of the Air Force Reserve and go into the Army National Guard system. And my first annual training was two weeks at Camp Pickett, Virginia, now called something else, but uh, in the middle of the summer in a World War II barracks, uh, just hating life. And I, at that point, thought I'd made a bad decision the Air Force, <laughs> as you can imagine well it's funny uh that you that you say that so how long was your second boot camp was it the same well, length as i a... think it was it's six to eight weeks you know and they bring in now it's all at one spot and i want to say maybe it's at fort knox but don't quote me on that it used to be in three spots across the country and they'd bring in like i'm guessing like two thousand three thousand uh, ROTC cadets that were going to get commissioned into the army in their junior year. And so you come in there and you'd go through the camp and they teach you a lot of, and they, they'd highlight the branches and they had involvement by the 82nd would put on training sessions for you and demonstrations and you would be put in leadership roles. And, okay. And, and, and then as that camp evolved and at the time they were really trying to get people on active duty but when it kind of inverted like in the peace dividend years of the 90s then it was hard to get on active duty and so that camp became kind of a uh a metric for whether you were going to make going on active duty or not it was very competitive but at my time when i went through it was like uh as long as you showed up and uh was in my uh you know comatose you could i mean semi-alert you could make it through the camp and okay yeah so yeah and it's happened many times over right. the, the the decades where but so it, it 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 was uh a little different when i when so when i got out of the navy i got out in 96 but i looked at transitioning services as well instead of just leaving the navy i looked at the different services and i actually talked to the army guys and having 10 years in the navy and e6 they they said nope you don't have to go back to boot camp we're going to send you to a i think it was a four week orientation course mm. which it was basically just you're going to learn the army nomenclature you're going to work, learn how to wear the uniform and but otherwise you're not going to be you know you're going to live in a nice barracks you're not going to live in an open bay barracks you know that kind of stuff so it seemed pretty easy so it sounded to me like 
because you were prior Air Force, they forced you to go through a little bit more stricter routine, which they should because Air Force, you know, we call it the chair force. <laughs> well, let me just clarify. I mean, in the Air Force, I was enlisted. And so, yeah, you were transitioning to, to be an officer. officer. Yeah, so yeah. they had to teach me. It was, yeah. took a lot of teaching and, to act right, how to act right. And I know? think that's the difference is probably, <laughs> right? Because, you know, enlisted going to enlisted is, is one thing. Enlisted an, from another branch going to the yeah. officer corps is an entirely different scenario. Yep. So you it, went through it, a, probably a modified uh, OTC officer training. Yes, and well, every every ROTC cadet has to go through it, um, and so that was a big how they assess officers is the bulk of it is through the ROTC programs. Right. So, anyway, I ended up um, not knowing any better. I threw down three branches, and at the time, this is how old I am. They did not have an aviation branch, and I wanted to fly like my dad did. So, they said to fly you. Had to put in for transportation corps or intelligence corps, one of the branches that had flying billets, and you would still you would be an intel officer, but you would fly, you know, collection aircraft or transportation. You'd fly transportation aircraft. Um, so I put down military intelligence, not knowing anything about it other than it sounded cooler than cool. shooting yeah. a cannon, and so. To my surprise, I got assessed to be an intelligence officer, and during that period, they stood up the aviation branch, so although I could have flown, but it was very tumultuous at that time on how to get into a flight billet and as they stood up the aviation branch, so I ended up being a straight intelligence officer for the majority, well, for my entire career, if you will. So that, That's, that's kind of ironic because our last veteran... Did was, the opposite. Did the exact opposite. He started off in the Army National Guard and transitioned to the Air Force so he could fly fighter jets. Mm. We, so. got, we got a mirror image over here. So what would so is that when you I mean the intelligence I would think that that's when pretty much all the fun stuff started. How did you how did you go straight into the uh ranger training or whatever? Well, yeah, so it, as I went to the officer basic training, which is out at uh, Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is the Center for Intelligence for the Army, and they train um, other enlisted service members, the Marines, Navy. They kind of share the wealth amongst the services, depending on the technical field you're going into within the, um, within the enlisted ranks. And there are some sharing of officers, but so I ended up going to Fort Huachuca, and at the time I was dead set on going on, on active duty. And when I got out there and I, uh, I literally showed up uh, off the plane with two duffel bags full of stuff and uh, got a ride in the shuttle to the, to the base, which is about an hour away from Tucson, and uh, had nothing. <laughs> and I'd not had a regular paycheck for, you know, I hadn't really worked a regular job yet. And so when I got that first paycheck, and it was kind of fun because you're a student and they, you know, treated us all right. And I was like, you know, this wouldn't be bad for one year, you know, do one tour gig. So I applied and was accepted to go on active duty. But at that time, I was out of cycle with the rest of the class because they had already gotten assignments and all of that. So at the time, I was working in the combined arms branch, which is all the uh, combat arms guys, you know, all the killers, the uh, infantry and and uh field artillery and other guys that have close contact with the the enemy uh intel being combat support but so they they said hey bill you need you know i said what should i do and they said well you need to go to airborne and ranger school not knowing anything about that i said sure <laughs> so uh <laughs> being out of cycle uh the branch manager normally it's very tough to get those billets but because he was not going in and asking for a whole bunch, as I understand it. It was much easier to get me into Airborne and Ranger School. So the next thing you know, I got orders to Airborne and Ranger School. And then I talked to some people that weren't, you know, combat arms. And they said, oh, you're going to Ranger School? <laughs> That's kind of tough. And I said, yeah, I heard it's kind of tough. It's only 60 days, you know. So anyway, I, I guess... The, I, I attribute the fact of, you know, ignorance got me through ranger school because I really didn't <laughs> know what was going to happen. I had been, you know, through, through the very common training that all soldiers get about, you know, m building a fighting position, 
you know, and do another common task. Right. So I thought, well, how hard could this be? It's very straightforward. Well, uh, I, yeah, I, th I attribute that of not knowing what it was like and not, you know, at the time there was obviously not the Internet where you could go in and see millions of videos about Ranger School. And so I just kind of went in blind and was I actually went in. This is going to be, you know, it, it not looked upon favorably by some Rangers, but I was what was called a leg Ranger. So I went to range, the way it worked out. I went to Ranger School first, and then Airborne after, um, which really kind of served me well because oftentimes you get hurt in Ranger School doing the jumps. So what we would do is we would help them get in the aircraft and everything, and then we'd be on the drop zone, and then we'd join up with them on the drop zone. Gotcha. Because we had four nationals there as yep. well, and that some of them weren't qualified. The Marine uh, that was with us was not Airborne qualified, so. It's not unheard of to have leg rangers. In fact, the class accommodates that. But, yes, it was a tough tough two months. It really, I mean, it burns into your psyche, into your DNA, I would say, some things. Yeah. And uh, you just never forget it, you know. And, and so, I, I, I attribute that. Um, it's the best decision I really made in terms of my military careers to go wow. to that school. So as a, as a non-serving person, as just an Army brat, um, Ranger school is where you learn all the cool stuff, like every freaking weapons platform and, and, and how to genuinely use those things to the best ability and how to command your squad or whatever. Is that is that what we're talking about here? This is, this is yeah, like well, special tactics and whatnot? So I've had this discussion before um, with a person that was um, Diana Nyad, I want to say her name is. She's the woman that swam from Cuba to the Keys, the only wow. person to ever do it. She, in fact, there was a recently a documentary on her on Netflix, um, and she was wondering, you know, because they had when I was talking to her, they had just started letting females into Ranger School, and I, I tried to I tried to explain to her that Ranger School is a leadership school, so it it builds your leadership character, and it's not a technical school like Bud School for the Seals oh, okay. is a leadership school, but it's also a weeding out and then. Um, getting the very, you know, the very finest of the finest off the top, and that's who you then assess into the SEALs. Whereas in Ranger School, and I'm just throwing a number out there, maybe 50% of those in the Ranger School are going on to the Ranger Regiment, and, and that number is just off the top of my head. But So the other 50% are going to be sprinkled throughout the force and hopefully bring leadership characteristics of the Ranger School to the rest of the oh interesting yeah because yeah. everyone who goes through seals ends buds up, training ends up on the teams right and well, same same with sf right yeah you either make it or you don't but if you make it you've got a shot yeah right, if you make yeah, it through yeah. right it's yeah. the beginning of a it's chance. the beginning of a chance it's the beginning of a chance to it's be the on the beginning a team. of a chance you know i have uh off topic i mean i've got a, a good buddy of mine in chesapeake that's probably one of the most known seals in the area and uh, I just talked to him about it, and I didn't know that once you get out of buds, that's that's not that's the beginning of that's that's like the introduction mm -hmm. yeah. to the chapter. There's a year afterwards where you have to meet all these requirements to actually make it, prove yourself, prove yourself. So you get out of buds, and that's the that's like the intro to a book. The next year is the is the is the rest of the story. Chapter one. Yeah, it's kind of I and again speaking way out of my uh, knowledge zone, which. As an intel officer, that's that's what we do. Yeah. But uh, there's no topic I know too little about that I won't comment on. Um, yeah, that's really the 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 what do you call it when you you know you refine gold and and the and the and the bad it's stuff comes up. Yeah, cross, yeah, that's so. that's what you know that school does is get you at least get you a, a potential candidate. Yeah, um, and Ranger School is somewhat in the same. They don't want anybody that comes there to pass so i think when and i'm just again guessing because it was a long time ago 19 yeah, i was in 1383 for those that care and you can <laughs> find the the class photos for all the ranger schools back quite a ways on uh, on the web now 13 and, 1383 was that your class number or the yeah. year you graduated it was both okay <laughs> just checking <laughs> so yeah it was it was like the last class we went in august which it's just a beautiful month in Georgia, as you can imagine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Nice, uh, cool weather, nice breeze. Yeah, but we, did, we actually, in Dahlonega, in the mountain phase, we had cold injuries, hypothermia, 
you know, in late August and early September because Dahlonega is kind of up there in altitude. But, right. Um, so, yeah, it was a long time ago. But our class started out with 160-ish, 158, and we ended up at about 60. Wow. So you can see the attrition rate. Now, some of those would be recycled. Yeah. But at least at the end of the day, those standing, you know, and some of those 58 or 60 were standing, had come from earlier classes and been injured and come back. So it's hard to say, you know, and I guess they have these stats, but there's quite an attrition rate. Did you get kicked out because you wouldn't eat the bugs or the snake or whatever in your survival training or whatever? Well, there's a variety of ways to get kicked out. And probably the most um, well, injuries probably I would suspect is the highest uh, failing patrols. Um, you got to at least be 50 percent on your patrols. And then um, then there's the. What I think is the best part of this experience is their peer reviews. So th at, at the end of each cycle, you get re reviewed by the guys and gal well, uh, now gals, guys that were next to you. So um, people get peered out, which if somebody says they don't make it through ranger school and then they say they were peered out, it's like, that's probably. You were hated. That's yeah. brutal. That's brutal. You're yeah. So you had what, what we called at the time spotlight rangers. So. When they were in a following position, they were just a, you know, a nug, a regular rifleman. They often cut corners, slacked off, didn't do good. But once they came into a leadership position, which they would be graded on, all of a sudden, they're all gun ho and everything. <laughs> and then as soon as they're out of the leadership position, they're, you know, that guy that fell asleep on security. Or, gotcha. You know, so those are the... Yeah. That's that's it. I've never heard that before. But what a great way to also weed out the non-hackers, man. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little so bit. Maybe you should start peer reviews on this uh, podcast. Hey, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm yeah, in big one. trouble. I, I need someone to take my chair. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk a little bit about military intelligence because let's be honest. Everyone who's not in military intelligence. Has no idea what the heck you're talking about. Well, the you know active duty military. If you've if you've served, you have an idea of what military intelligence is. Well, my question is, is there's a ton of stuff that you just can't talk about. I would imagine. Is there a fair amount of stuff that you're just not allowed to talk about in your experiences and your actual job for the military as an intelligence officer? You can't mention X. Because that's say what we're trying to get out of you. <laughs> <laughs> the X, the X factor. Um, I would put it this way, specific details about operational information about right. a specific thing that's going on, like in Iraq or back during Desert Storm or, or that or just cause in Panama. Yeah, we're not we can't discuss those things. But the general concept of military intelligence and how it supports the overall uh, military effort, military yep. operation, I mean, are, is I mean, it's clearly not uh, a subject that we cannot, uh, how do I say that in double negative, um, that we can discuss. H how does military intelligence uh, enable, you know, victory on the battlefield, let's say? Yeah. And we can talk about that. But talking about a certain system or capability or method or source, obviously you would not want to discuss that. So in your role specifically... Is military intelligence broke up into different segments? Somebody handles logistics and operations. Somebody else handles planning and strategy. And someone else handles uh, intel on opposition forces and things like that. Well, let's, uh, I hate to say the word complicated. But <laughs> um, ultimately, you know, you're there to support the, I'll call them the decision man maker or the commander. Um and so you typically as a lieutenant and a captain, even as a major, you're in ta tactical intelligence, let's call it. And so you're within an organization like a brigade or a division or a core and what your function is and all of the intelligence professionals there are doing is supporting the commander who's making decisions about operations, current and future. And so that's your whole focus. What does a commander need? In, a, in a order to be able to execute their plan that they have for the upcoming, you know, campaign or, or battle or whatever it might be. And so your collection methods, your, your skills and all of that uh, are focused on supporting that. And then you can transition into 
more operational. Uh, so there's really tactical, operational, strategic. Okay. You're still supporting com- uh, decision maker, but uh, at much higher echelons. Okay. And so you're then maybe in a Intel pure organization and not in a, a combat arms tactical division. Gotcha. You know, so you're mm-hmm. you're supporting decision makers in the Pentagon or decision makers at the at the what well, I don't think it's called COCOM, but at the like at CENTCOM or PACOM. So there's it's different strata le- 